Okay, let's uh, just begin. It's half past six, uh, and uh, welcome uh, to the LSE. Those of you who are not normally here, and those of you who you possibly normally are, welcome also. Um, this is uh, an event really surrounding the launch of a book uh, called How to Be a Successful Economist, your guide to careers in economics, and how to be a good economist as well to get the qualification there before you do go into the career. Uh, my name is Tony Travers. Uh, I'm a professor and associate dean in the School of Public Policy here at the LSE, and I'm very pleased uh, to be welcoming Ian Harwood, Andy Ross, and welcoming for the umpteenth, in a good sense, time, uh, Vicky Price to LSE uh, for the launch of their book. They said it's called How to Become a Successful Economist. Which they co authored with co Calvin Bird. I'm very, also very pleased to welcome our online audience, welcome online audience around the world. Uh, and of course, that gives you a clue that we're not just live in the studio here, but we're also um, incoming. Um, it's easy to so do the we're going to ask questions both from the lecture here at the theatre and also if you're watching from elsewhere. Now, what the book does uh, is to explore the wealth and career opportunities open to those with an interest in economics. And the authors reflect on how students can, can become successful economists. They all have. Um, we've heard some of them from some others already uh, on the screens here. So it's an ideal complement to skills and employability, employability modules on economics courses. The book is clearly designed for people studying economics today with a view potentially to a career and those who want to guide students to assemble the toolkit necessary to be a good economist. So there are chapters on the range of issues. I won't go through them all. You can buy the book afterwards if you want outside. Demystifying the roles and in industries that typically recruit economists, which is quite a wide range these days. Explore the importance of strong communications, quantitative and broader soft skills and how to develop these. And on about which, you know, the extent to which graduate qualifications matter or don't, and so on. There are candid reflections on the advantages and drawbacks of particular career paths, as well as insights contributed by the authors, recent graduates, and experienced industry professionals. So those with um, working in industries such as financial services, government policy, journalism, and consultancy have all contributed uh, to in conversations with the authors, and this is reflected not only in the book, but with full video interviews that can be found either in the ebook version of the title or with accompanying online resources. So that's the serious bit out of the way. For those who are, wish to tweet, there are for Twitter users, uh, the hashtag for today's event is hashtag LSE Public Policy. Uh, and I also um, point out, please put your phones off if you haven't already. The event is being recorded and will be made will be made available as a podcast uh, as soon as possible and of course there will be an opportunity to ask questions and receive replies if you're going to do that uh, remember it is all being uh, recorded right so introduce the speakers uh, the speakers are uh, coming around from my left Ian Howard currently uh, economic advisor at Redbird, stockbroking firm providing research advice to institutional investors, fellow of the Society of Professional Economists and currently a member of the Management Board of the Southwestern University's doctoral training program. Um, Andy Ross is visiting professor at Birkbeck, University of London, former head of professional development for the government economic service and later for the Society of Professional Economists and former deputy director of the Treasury. And last but not least, Vicky Price, Chief Economic Advisor at the Centre for Economics and Business Research, and an alumna of the LSE. She's also the author, which we also launched here at the school, uh, Women versus Capitalism, Why We Can't Have It All in a Free Market Economy, amongst other publications, some of which I see reflected in this book as well. So we're going to have three presentations. Uh, uh, first from Andy, I think, to get this thanks to Vicky, and then from Ian, and then I will look stern if they speak for too long. Plenty of time for QA. So we've got slides ready. Okay. 
Good. Hi, good. Right. Well, I studied at the London School of Economics in uh, 1975, and even then I was classed as a mature student, apparently. Uh, so I I'd probably reluctantly have to concede that I'm, I've passed the halfway mark in my career. Um, so that gives me a good viewpoint, though, to look back and to report back. Uh, it was all that hard studying at the LSE um, to get an economics degree worthwhile. And I'm very pleased to say that, apart from my wife and my kids, of course, uh, it was one of the best things, or perhaps the best thing that ever happened to me. So it's tremendous. Um, in fact, Alvin Birdie did a larger sample, and he asked lots and lots of people who have an economics degree if they had their time again, would they still choose to have studied economics? And 85% uh, said yes. Um, we interviewed, as you saw, uh, to send lots of um, eminent practitioners, economists, uh, economists, and particularly practitioners, because this book is trying to give insight into where most uh, economists work, actually, which is outside academia, to balance more academic, perhaps, approaches. And we asked them again, uh, if they would choose to be an economist again. And uh, luckily, and perhaps not surprisingly, they all said yes. And so on that tape, uh, if you buy the electronic version or the hardback, you get access to those. And uh, on there, there's such luminaries as uh, Lord Gus, Gus O'Donnell, Dame Kate Barker, Lord Stern, Dame uh, Richard Griffiths. And as you can see, I'm name dropping like mad. Even the Dalai Lama tells me not for name dropping. Um, <laughs> Uh, and on the video, I particularly like Andy Haldane's uh, aside that he's not only an economist, but he's a failed musician and a failed cricketer. So I, I identify now as an economist and a failed Nobel Prize laureate. Okay. So anyway, as uh, was said by Tony, we've all done very well out of economics and we're trying to put uh, something back into the book. And so I will turn to the book. Uh, first of all, this collage, which I'm just trying to show sort of the rich environment you can work in. And, uh, you know, you've got the great legacies of great minds from the past. Uh, if ever you think you've said something original, you probably haven't read widely enough. Um, then there's the journalists, the good ones I've picked out, not the bad ones. Uh, the think tanks, of course, do a great job. It's international, because economies are international, of course. Uh, we have finance, Kevin Daly, uh, advises investment bankers. Surprisingly, a very, very nice chap. And uh, then we have the civil service, of course. Uh, who have been working very hard uh, the last few days. And I did learn that when a politician uh, criticises civil servants, it's usually because they're not up to the job themselves. Um, and heads of uh, GS that I, I work for, unfortunately, I just missed Gus, but uh, you know, I had a great time there. So it, it's very rich and some great people up there, some great economists, and all except perhaps for that rather handsome chap top middle, um, who's very much in the B list compared to uh, the guys up there. But we're very careful to stress in the book that uh, yeah, success has lots of aspects. It's not just sort of um, fame and uh, money. And I found just serving some of these guys was tremendously fulfilling uh, and yeah, very satisfactory, and I, I, particularly when they were trying to advance uh, public service, which so many of them were. Um, but, you know, I don't want to sound too noble. Um, you might have noticed that I haven't exactly starved. Um, so it's been quite a good living as well. Okay. Um, let's see if this thing works. Okay, there's the cover and a nice yellow. And there's another terrific book out by Paul Johnson, uh, How to Follow the Money. You can see his copied our cover, but then he's a great writer. And <laughs> imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Um, this is what it's trying to do. There's actually two sort of headline messages. One is, you know, hey, it's great to be an economist. It's, it's, it's a great life. Uh, the second one is we need more experts uh, in the world, not fewer. And then there's a couple of riders. A couple of riders are that economics is uh, best when it's useful, and economists are most effective when they're diverse, and more of that later. Anyway, we're trying to encourage readers to become professional economists for themselves and for the world. We're trying to get people to avoid the mistakes that we've inevitably made during our long careers mm -hmm. and hopefully uh, help academics um, sort of have more insight into the practitioner world and, and orientate, uh, orientate towards that. Okay, first chapter 
is inclined to say, why be an economist? And there's lots of very good reasons, altruistic, interesting, and financial. But a picture tells uh, you know, a thousand words. And these people here are happy uh, inductees. They were for the Government, Econo uh, Government Economic Service when I used to run those uh, lovely inductions at Sunningdale Civil Service College. Uh, but the thing you note about all these people, they're, they're smiling because they've all become economists. Okay? <laughs> so if you're not smiling, now you know why, uh, become an economist. Very clear message. We go through all the jobs, as Tony said, in great detail. Um, I think it's the most comprehensive um, sort of breakdown evaluation of, of all the different jobs. And I'm pleased to see that lots of careers officers say exactly the same thing. You will notice that university is actually one of the smaller destinations for uh, economists. And these are only the jobs that you do, you carry on as an economist. Um, Obviously, a degree in economics prepares you for almost any graduate job, you know, um, but these are ones as an economist. And, uh, you know, it's a very, very rich environment there again. Okay, it's, it's, you know, it, there are many aspects to success, but it's nice to be paid well for what you do as well. And so we look at the um, earnings, expected sort of earnings, median earnings for all the degree subjects. And you will see that five years out, um, economics, in fact, is only second to medicine and dentistry in expected earnings. And you know how much dentists charge nowadays. Uh, and if you're a high flyer, and of course, a lot of economists are high flyer, then in fact, 10 years out, uh, the median of the upper quartile uh, is, for economics, the highest of all those subjects. Uh, so you can do well as an economist. I must admit, you know, even myself, at one point, I was earning almost as much as my family was spending. So. <laughs> um, but, so we've had the headline message, but this we looked uh, with the help of Diane Coyle, uh, whom we interview, of course, and things that we think would be very useful. We, we do praise economics teaching, but of course, like most things, we think it could be better. And we think it could be better by looking perhaps a bit more practitioner world. And so we look at awareness of past policies and current real, real world concepts. And nothing is more salutary and wipes off the arrogance of economists than looking at the mistakes we've made in the past. Uh, so that's that's very, very uh, salutary indeed. Limitations is very important. And I think they should be stressed more. Um, I'm, I'm very worried about graduates who are very impressed by sophisticated techniques, but haven't really got a deep grasp of the fundamentals. They're quite dangerous people, actually. Uh, and in fact, for a practitioner, it's more important to know the limitations, perhaps, than to know the model in the first place. In academia, you lose a few marks or a few colleagues laugh at you. Uh, in policy, you may ruin a few million lives. And so I test the graduates when they come out and tell me complicated things. Um, I, I, I ask them, you know, if you subsidize a single product, what happens? And they say, well, the price goes down, quantity expands. And I say, okay, so why don't we just print loads of money uh, and spend, uh, subsidize everything, all prices go down, all quantities go up, isn't that marvelous? And then they know that's not right, but then they need to be able to explain why. What is it in the supply and demand framework that doesn't cope with that? Uh, and they, they need to understand the basic model as well. <laughs> Same thing as something like immigration, simple supply and demand just yeah. doesn't work. Uh, although down the pub, you find out lots of people tell you to go and learn some economics, but you talk about it. The best to say you're a plumber in a pub. Okay. Uh, practical data handling skills, very important. You're not going to avoid that. I'll talk about maths in a moment. Communication, I'll come back, on, uh, back to. Pluralism, eclectic. You can't argue with eclectic because eclectic simply means choosing the best for the job. Uh, and if you're trying to bang in a nail with a screwdriver, it's not the screwdriver that's at fault. Um, pluralism is more controversial. Uh, some people think it means that all knowledge is equal uh, or that uh, everything, anything goes, which I don't agree with. But uh, we put another argument for practitioners in that you, know, you, you will have stakeholders and you have to understand the world view of your stakeholders. If you don't, you're not very useful to them. And so studying other paradigms, if you want to use that word, is, is very useful. So that's another argument. Deduction, in, induction, go out and actually talk to people on the ground. As Gillian Tett says, get your feet dirty. Okay. Um, let me look at, uh, again, trying to make um, more, more useful. And um, again, that distinction, you know, for, put it in a nutshell, 
Uh, academic freedom is, is vital for academics in a democracy. It's a very good thing. Uh, for civil servants, it's right also for democracy that they serve the government of the day. And a senior civil servant has far more obligation to serve the government of the day than, um, I don't know, so, uh, a sports presenter or something like that. <laughs> Communication, very, very important. This is the biggest skills gap that uh, employers uh, complain about, that you can't, uh, that students can't, um, uh, can't explain complexity uh, simply. Uh, the irony is that Ian and I here have been banging on about the need for good communication for ages and ages, so we're obviously failing to get our message across. Uh, so there we are. And I learned from three uh, heads of the Government Economic Service. Uh, for Dave Ramsden, he taught me that the more important someone is, the less time they tend to have to listen to you. Um, Vicky Price taught me that um, if all you can say is things are very difficult and complicated, then you won't be invited back. And then Lord Stern, who put it, Nicholas Stern put it so succinctly in a marvellous demonstration, to convince people that they generally have to understand what you're saying. And then a little example which actually saw, you know, if you use subject to normal statistical error to a minister or a CEO, you know, if, if they don't know what inference statistics is about, then it's fine. I mean, it's statistically proper to say that. But all the minister or the CAO hears is, my numbers are wrong, they're usually wrong. So be careful. You have to think what the audience is hearing, not what you're saying. Maths, I go through that. And it's, you know, it's fair to say that if you're going to be an academic and perhaps a producer of models, you need pretty good um, math skills, advanced skills. If you're going to be an intelligent consumer of economics, perhaps not so much. And that's where Dame Rachel Griffiths is quoted saying roughly that. Uh, and she you know, was president of the Royal Economic Society. And um, so it has to be said, you know, maths is really, really useful. It really is that there are roles that you don't actually need so, uh, so much math. So you know, don't be put off by anything. Take 12 books from your uh, bookcase and arrange them every second, 24-7. How long will it take you to exhaust all the possible permutations? Will it take you a week? A month? No. It would actually take you more than 15 years, which is astonishing. If, you're, uh, if you know what a 12 factorial is, then you'll understand uh, why. Uh, so maths can be very useful for reading things that aren't intuitively obvious. Again, if you tell me about Lagrangian multipliers for co-integration, I'm not impressed if I can fool you with simple data. And I fooled lots of people who come sniffing around sometimes. Um, I can show, you know, this is very exciting. Look at this thing, it's growing. It's overtaking the world. This is where the action is. And then when someone else sniffs around, who are all these people? Why do we need all these people? I put it in percentage terms. I say, well, there's nothing to see here. And I move on, it's dying out. I mean, it's fading away. And it's exactly the same data. This is one's absolute, one's percentage. If you're an econometrician, always remember, as the legendary uh, Ron Smith from Birkbeck would tell you, eyeball the data. And remember, you can get almost identical econometric outputs from very, very different data. You need to be aware of all that. And then you get the awful tabloids who do terrible things like this. Uh, all immigrants take... That's right. Immigrants take 100% of new jobs or something, which of course is nonsense. You can use the same technique to show that all new jobs are taken by people with red hair or uh, people with economics degrees, which would be a good thing. <laughs> this um, is also the need for interpersonal skills. And you know, your economics won't uh, get you a success if that's all you have, unless you're a very obscure uh, consultant or something. In any organisation, you're going to need these uh, misnamed soft skills because they're actually very hard, of course. Mm. You can um, learn them the easier way, which is, you know, study them and practice them and watch uh, 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 exam exemplars of it. Or you can learn it uh, the hard way through bitter experience and mistake and stress for you and everybody around you. Uh, this picture is simply the joke that um, a good economist, uh, an economist with good interpersonal skills is somebody who looks at your shoes when they're talking to you, not their own shoes. It's most, most unfair joke. <laughs> uh, but there we are. So, uh, you know, Gus O'Donnell didn't get to be the top of the uh, civil service, let alone the government economic service, uh, just by being uh, an extremely good economist. They had superb 
soft skills and diplomacy, uh, although I suspect he might have to have bitten his tongue more often, frequent, uh, more frequently recently. Um, but there we are. I won't speak for him, of course. Um, chapter eight uh, is about uh, diversity, both in thought and the body of economies. I have found out, ironically, that it's impossible to write a chapter on diversity that everybody's happy with. But putting that aside, it stresses how important this is. Um, economics is terribly important for society and how things work. And it must never fall into being an, an elitist subject. And it's in terms of teaching in schools, it's going far too far that way. And then there's the gender and ethnic, etc. And um, Vicky would be talking about gender in a moment. Um, but, you know, it, you have to uh, understand the actual lived experience of everybody in the community um, to really do good economics. Wouldn't be a very good book on how to be a successful economist if it didn't help you get actually get a job as an economist. Um, so we give you lots of tips. And one thing I wish I'd been told when I was younger, you know, it's OK to be nervous. You know, nervous is natural. Even the most confident people actually are nervous. And if you learn to harness that and use it, it can actually give you energy. Uh, so I wish someone had told me that when I was younger. And we'd go through what um, psychologists call the arousal performance curve. Well, they would, wouldn't they? Uh, I, I, che I checked also that I can still pass the fast stream, the government fast stream online assessment test. And uh, luckily <laughs> for my credibility, I did. So there we are. And we also have reports and interviews from actual organisations, um, actual interviews, anonymous, of course, and lots and lots of the type of questions you might get. Once you're a successful economist, of course, we want you to stay a successful economist. So there's lots of advice on how to keep up the, the sources and free data so you don't have to uh, join Bloomberg or anything. Um, and lots of things we think that might happen in the future. And it's, so far, it's been quite precedent, uh, prescient. Um, it, it, we, we've got it right. Um, but it goes through the things where you know we're very good established economics individual constrained maximization we're very good at that but that's not the whole world uh you have to come to more difficult things uh relationships that uh, between people trying to harness civil society and things like social capital which are very very hard to operationalize but extremely important you know and if you if you approach relationships if you approach your own relationships as if it's all physics, you, you might well experience Newton's first law of motion. Um, we make a special plea for cost-benefit analysis because it seems to have just fallen out of many degrees. And that's not because it's necessarily right, but because it's ubiquitous. And we think the balance is wrong in many degrees because you need to know about this stuff. There's the famous Green Book using government, of course. The film won an Oscar, slightly different. Um, but, uh, you know, it's ubiquitous in business cases is, is really a form of cost benefit analysis. Uh, and certainly in government, it's used an awful lot. And I so say you need to understand that and its limitation to really see what's going on. We go through behavioral economics and you know, bounded rationality. So let's do a quick experiment. Um, I want to shape your perception. So think of Megan and Harry. And now pick a card, please. Pick a card. Pick a card. You picked a card. Right. Now put your hand up. Put your hand up if I've removed your card, please. Look at that. That's psychology. I made you all pick the same card. If after reasonable time you can't work out work out how a cheap trick like that is done, then perhaps don't think of becoming an economist. But there we are. Uh, but it shows yeah, there's cognitive limitations to what we can do. We also show um, what's often called the preservation of capital, this identity. The, Conceptually, economics to be complete has to be interdisciplinary. There's no, there's no other way. It has to bring in the other social sciences, has to bring in science. Uh, and this, you can see goods and services in the market is GDP. It's not an insignificant part, but it's not the whole thing. I disagree that economists are completely obsessed with GDP. I, I challenge you to pick up any introductory tome in economics that doesn't go on at length about how limited GDP is a measure of welfare. Um, but we use this and you know, natural capital and, again, social capital, but big society, as Cameron tried to call it, but civic society, all these things are extremely important. We also stress, though, it's nice to the excited new stuff, but you do need to know the old stuff very well as well to be an effective economist. So I've laid out, laid out, and I think, what well, is a systematic way, 
not seen done quite as um, systematically this way, um, sort of what you might call an older economics, mainstream economics, and cleared up a few things that annoyed me, uh, confusion such as the merit goods. You know, merit goods are nothing to do with market failure, although most textbooks say it is. It's actually an older concept from Musgrave, cognitive error. It's just that the individual may not know with all the information, whatever, what is best for them. That's outside the um, paradigm of neoclassical economics. It's, pater it's uh, paternalism, but it's still very important. So anyway, they're, they're all the uh, chapters of the book. Okay? And I think finally, Tony, you're looking at his watch. I, I will say, you know, the bottom line is, uh, I can tell you, I'm qualified at my age to tell you that there are pleasures in life that will come and go. But economics is a lifelong pleasure. So enjoy life, become an economist. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Just a quick question on the screen saying the slides are not showing up on screen. I don't know what that. Oh, no, no. They are. Okay. okay. We have to home. They are apparently. Speaking, sorry to interrupt. Oh, good. Um, well, thank you very much for hosting this, uh, Tony, and, and thank you also um, for. Um, this uh, initial presentation. So um, we were all hesitating really about what we're going to focus on. And we, we just hadn't rehearsed it first time around when we did it at the treasury and it worked out okay. So then we thought maybe we'll try and do something similar again. Uh, and it hasn't been exactly the same, mainly because of course, so many things are happening uh, and also because of the audience. So in my case, I have one of my daughters here who I hadn't realized, I have uh, my brother watching from Greece, who uh, was texting me, would you believe it, saying, stop using your mobile. And I couldn't tell him that I was using my mobile because I was conversing with my daughter, who is here now, who I thought was lost outside, only to eventually realize that she was sitting at the back, waving at me. Yeah. So it was, it was a little bit like that. So it sort of uh, ends up, therefore, the whole thing being very different. Uh, how it flows and what we do. And I know that Tony's going to look at the time and already taken you know, a minute covering that. But it is a different occasion than the one we had before in the Treasury. And loads of things have happened since. I mean, we had a crisis, uh, a banking crisis, just, you know, this weekend, uh, another intervention. There is now a possibility that interest rates are not going to be going up as they, would go, they were going to go up before. You know, what have we economists done? Did we forecast uh, this sort of thing? And of course, we do have a very bad reputation of not being able to forecast things correctly. So, so what I did is I looked at um, what Google says about us. So uh, I looked at uh, what is the problem with, with economics, first of all. It gave me two billion results in 48 seconds. So, so there is obviously rather a lot that is wrong with economics. I got something similar when I went to, you know, what is wrong with economists. Uh, so pretty bad too, but not anything like as bad as economics. So we are known as a dismal science. And of course we do get loads of things wrong, um, but at least we can analyze things. And the importance of what I'm gonna be talking about and what the book does is it encourages people to really think about evidence. And given what's been going on in the last decade, Evidence seems to have been sort of thrown out of the window. I remember when I worked for the government, and I'm sorry about this, Gus, uh, we were referring to at least one department, and you know which one it is, as the evidence-free zone, because basically they weren't looking at that data. And I remember also very recently, in fact, uh, doing a, a presentation to the analysts of one particular government department, now that I'm on the outside. And when I finished, they said, oh, this is really, really interesting stuff. We didn't know uh, about this. How, how can we get hold of it and, and put it into policy? Um, and I said, actually, it's all your data. I've used everything that you have given me in the past or I've been able to get in the past to, to provide uh, that information. And of course, what is going on around us is that quite a lot of knowledge about economics just isn't there. I think what, uh, what Andy was saying is, 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 is really important that you know, there is a certain amount of knowledge you, you collect, but what you collect more than anything else if you're doing economics is the ability to question, to think about, you know, if A, then possibly B, but it may be C if this happens, and argue uh, the various things that way. But of course, predicting, since I started talking about that, is very difficult. And anyone who ends up having to do economic forecasts 
as I had to do for a while, you know, it's really on no, my hand for nothing, really. Uh, I mean, they may get paid a lot in um, uh, banks and, and, and uh, hedge funds and so on. Uh, but in reality, you can get it so wrong and you can just lose your job, of course, very, very quickly. And it is not terribly satisfying as, as part of the thing that you can do. So there are loads of possibilities of what you can do uh, with, with economics. But what you cannot do is allow for that evidence to be ignored. And one of the things that my brother was uh, also uh, telling me is stop fiddling while you're looking at things. And that is because, of course, you know, one loses the things one wants to talk about. But the thing I wanted to refer to is what happened with Brexit. So um, David Davis in 2018, okay? David Davis, who was uh, basically the main negotiator, well, at least from the government's viewpoint, the tr he said, the Treasury, the OBR, Office of Budget Responsibility, and the Bank of, of England between them produce numerous forecasts every year. When was the last time that any of them got it right? As if that meant that you shouldn't really be listening to anything that was being said uh, about about Brexit. And, uh, and then uh, there was you know, another statement which basically said, uh, at the time, if you remember, he was asked, all these papers were produced by the various government departments about the impact of Brexit on various sectors of the economy. Have you uh, not you know, seen them? Why are we not, in fact, talking about them? And he said, I don't believe in anything that economists write. So uh, that's that. So uh, that isn't particularly good for economists. It isn't particularly good for your you know, psyche, if you like. One isn't particularly good for all the marvelous government economists who, who do uh, all the work. But uh, you do perhaps have um, uh, an assessment of what the various uh, departments were doing, the economics and all the other analysts, analysts of course, because we link up and have done and still do um, with uh, the statisticians, the operational researchers, and I'm really delighted that we also have um, Dame uh, Karen Dunnell, who was a previous chief statistician here with us. Um, but what you do in the end is that facts come right. So I'm quoting Rishi Sunak in Belfast. You probably know this by heart by now. Um, and I wrote it in my terrible handwriting. Forgive me, my brother, if you're looking at, at me again from Greece. So. Um, Northern Ireland, he said, is in the unbelievably special position, unique position in the entire world. And at that stage, he was going sit like this, you know, just <laughs> in having privileged access, not just in the UK market, uh -huh, but also the EU single market. Nobody else has that. No one is what he said. I'm not, I'm not doing it exactly the way he did, but more or less. Only you guys, he said, only here. Well, uh, the economists have been proven right. And what is more, there are loads and loads of other impacts that had not been calculated. This is the Times, Tuesday, 31st of January, okay? The headline, horny rhinos can't read because of Brexit warns zoos. Well, did we get that one at all in our predictions? No. So uh, you, it's a very, very interesting article how we can't get rhinos from elsewhere to do whatever they're supposed to be doing. And, and we're running out of rhinos, it seems. So no, that is an extra cost. Did we calculate this? No. Uh, but what basically it all uh, uh, you know, shows is that you know, evidence matters. And, but there are some issues that we're looking at uh, more widely, social issues, for example, uh, and uh, Andy already mentioned the, the, the diversity issue, where we, we take an issue and we think, you know, it's, uh, it, you know, it's the Me Too, it's, uh, you know, a very important one, uh, and ensuring there are enough women in, in, on board simply because it's good for diversity. Of course, it does something also for businesses, but frankly, there's very little else um, for the moment. Uh, and we have the job as economists to look at not necessarily justifying these particular things that are happening, but, but certainly worrying about the implications of not fixing some of the things that are going wrong, such as uh, women's position in the workplace, because they are market failures. Market failures, if you, know, you were listening to Nick Stern, uh, you know, was his deputy when he was uh, writing the um, Climate Change Review. Uh, we have to monetize all those market failures and we have to look at the externalities and see what they actually mean in terms of loss output uh, in, in the economy and how we can step in and help. 
So uh, basically, as you can uh, see in the title of what I've got is that market failures are there and the markets won't solve them. What also isn't going to solve them is that this doesn't work. So oh moving into, into the next one. That's it. Shall I do, use it from here? Thank you. So uh, if we did nothing and just left things as they are, left it to the market economy, you know, I've written about this. Uh, we're going to take quite some time for uh, women to actually re uh, reach uh, equality. It varies from region to region, inevitably. And if you're in a developed one, then that you know, works you know, reasonably well. But we're still going to have to wait 60 years. And, and however hopeful we may be about science, I don't think I'm going to be around to see that happen in Europe. And there are major failures that are still there because if you look at the impact that actually having women working at their full potential uh, all across the world it would have on uh, GDP, well-being, so gas was very keen on well-being, well-being and, and everything else that you can possibly think of productivity, then, then uh, obviously having uh, some way of stopping all those or, or dealing with all those um, obstacles that are there right now uh, preventing women from taking the, the the full position, if you like, in the economy. Uh, I mean, all that would uh, would lead to a very significant improvement. Now, the gap is big; it varies from place to place, and you can see sort of opening up, if you like, as you come further down uh, the, the 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 ranking there. But this is the pay gap, and you can see the in the EU the pay gap remains very stubbornly high, and worse, of course, in some countries than others. Uh, and it also happens in the civil service. So uh, I look at I looked at HMRC. There's still a gap there. Uh, and the interesting thing, of course, is uh, overall in the economy as a whole, if you look at the gap uh, of uh, um, uh, of people who work you know full time versus those who work part time, the gap is enormous. It's 37 percent. A very large percentage of women work part time, and uh, and therefore they suffer a lot of earnings through their life. And of course, by the time they get to the pension age, you've seen this ads by Scottish widows uh, in uh, around the tube and everywhere else, and they end up with a fifth of the pension uh, wealth of, of men uh, who work full time. And the ONS tries to look at this. I mean, that's the interesting thing. It tries to measure what the differences are uh, accounted for, accounted by, and is able to look at a number of factors. And, and it can only really come up with about you can, can't see this at the top, 36% of explanation. The rest uh, is all uh, possibly down to, to bias, uh, which is a problem. And then I think uh, uh, Andy was talking about, you know, the, the wall of, of fame, if you like, the one, all the pictures out there. Well, I mean, if you look at who influences, that matters hugely. If women are in a position of influencing, position of making decisions, then you also get more women uh, being hired and you get perhaps different different policies being put in, in place. So you can see in terms of economics, the top authors uh, running think tanks, top economic departments, well, they are in a real minority and I'm afraid they're remaining uh, in that. If you look at central bank uh, governors, uh, finance ministers, uh, economic advisory councils and economic institutions, again, you see that uh, may uh, uh, sort of presence dominates. Um, and the share of women as chief economists in insurance firms, banks, and, and of course the largest private companies uh, is also tiny. So why worry? This is basically uh, my final slide. Um, we worry because the market signals uh, are just not there to encourage the improvement in overall welfare. That is, of course, in terms of the, of the, the market itself, there's short-termism in the market, we know that full well. There's lack of transparency. That's one of the market failures, of course, we always identify. Uh, and competitive markets are distorted. You just don't have the people there to do the jobs that you like to have. You don't have a choice. So you're not competing those who are not particularly good away. So you have the pay gap, you have job ghettoization, you have lack, lack of seniority in various levels, and that's another sign of market failure. Uh, and the only way in which progress has been made in a number of areas, whether you look at climate change, for example, um, whether you, I mean, and if you look at women's position in the job market as well, has been through government intervention. Uh, but even that government intervention tends to be uh, sometimes just on paper and isn't necessarily as effective as, as it should be. And also, of course, the, 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 the way in which you can encourage uh, a different attitude requires also um, being able to enforce uh, whatever it is that you want to do. And very often, some of those legislations come out, for example, publishing uh, the, the pay gaps in big firms, and then there is no, um, if you like, follow-up that happens from the government. Uh, 
Um, I mean, you've seen, of course, when those figures come out very strongly, like at the BBC, uh, when it was obvious that um, presenters sitting next to each other, women presenters sitting next to the men, realized that actually the men were earning hugely more uh, than they did. And I'm not talking about Gary Lineker here, but I'm talking about the normal sort of uh, women uh, presenters uh, and doing the types of stuff that we all uh, watch on TV, uh, the news, for example. Um, so better measurement is absolutely important of unproductive activities as we call them, uh, because women, of course, spend an awful lot of time doing things which are not part of their market. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing is if they take on some more of that themselves, then they end up, that is, ends up not being calculated as part of the GDP. And slowly we get in there. Uh, so there is a lot more to do. So really seriously understanding uh, where the gaps are in knowledge, where the gaps are in measurement, and, and how we can seriously move to identifying where the market failures are and suggesting where perhaps uh, policy can change to, to accommodate this. So this is very much part of, of, of what we've been uh, thinking when we put this book together, uh, ways perhaps of empowering economists to just do a little bit more of this and, and also be listened to and do it in a way, particularly the way that we express things, the way we do the analysis, the way we talk publicly about these things, that can have resonance, just not just with policymakers, but also with the public at large. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, let me conclude with a few hopefully helpful comments about careers in the city, where I've spent the last four and a half decades working. Um, the range of which is described in chapter two and earlier highlighted by Andy. Um, I haven't got any slides, so I'm just going to make six basic points. Um, the first point I'd like to make is that the city recruitment practices now are determinedly meritocratic. So whatever your social or ethnic background, anyone applying for a job in the city is likely to be judged on the basis of merit alone. I say that because it wasn't always so, and indeed some people still uh, put across the notion that it still is the case that when you start in, to get a job in the city, you have to know somebody. It's not so much what you know, it's who you know. That used to be the case, but it's no longer the case. And I was actually very lucky when I first started back in the late 1970s, because quite by accident, I applied for a job which a firm, which I subsequently discovered, was actually deliberately recruited on a meritocratic basis. Um, I was very lucky because I don't think I'd got a job any otherwise because I didn't know anybody in the city and I knew very little about the city. But it's rather telling this firm made five job offers that year to graduates, three of them for to men and two to women. And that was quite revolutionary at the time. Thankfully, things have now changed in measure of people the better. And I think anybody applying for a job in the city will have a fair crack of the whip and be judged upon their potential ability rather than their social background or anything else. The second point I'd like to make, and Andrew's already stressed this very emphatically, is to highlight the stellar importance of communication, both written and oral. We devote a fair amount of our book to this issue because it is so important. And these skills are absolutely essential to a practicing economist, and nowhere more so than in the ultra-competitive environment of the city. The majority of people with whom you interact in the city aren't trained economists. You have, therefore, to avoid jargon and use plain language. You'll also need to remember that time is a very scarce commodity, which makes it all the more important to be succinct and to the point. Otherwise, you'll never build effective relationships, and you'll never secure that mark of appreciation the repeat visit. The third point I'd make is that distinguish yourself as an economic practitioner in the city. You don't just need to have a first rate mastery of the basic principles of economics, both macro and micro, but also immensely helpful to have a working knowledge of what's happened in the past, economic and financial history, if you like. Good examples of this, which have been very helpful in the last 15 years, have been knowing what happened in the Great Depression of the early 1930s, invaluable for understanding what was happening in the global financial crisis, and of course the steps which were taken to stop it turning into the Great Depression Mark II, and subsequently, of course, knowledge of the great inflation of the 1970s, so useful at the current juncture in terms of the lessons which were learned during the 1970s and subsequently. 
It's also immensely helpful to know about more financial crises, which of course occur time and time again. And we've had an example of this, of course, over the weekend, as Vicky mentioned, with the collapse of SBB in the US. Uh, the economic historian Charles Kindleberger described financial crises as a hardy perennial. And his classic manias, panics and crashes, a history of financial crises, first published in 1978, is invaluable in this respect. I read it at the very beginning of my career and learned a great deal as a consequence. Ironically, Kindleberger subsequently updated his book several times to take account of fresh crises. Um, after 1978, there was the Latin American low crisis of the early 80s. Then there was the collapse of the Japanese bubble economy in the early 1990s. Then came along the Asian financial crisis in the late 1990s. And then, of course, you had the implosion of the dot-com boom in the early noughties. They will come along again. And a knowledge of how past generations of economists tackle past challenges, best described as the history of economic thought, is also immensely helpful. The fourth point I'd emphasize is the importance of thinking globally. Economies and financial markets have undergone a remarkable globalization during the course of recent decades. And it's important to set analysis of national economies in this context. If you're responsible for analyzing the UK economy, for instance, it's immensely helpful to know what's going on in the United States, in the Euro area, China, and of course, other emerging markets. The fifth point I'd make about working as a city economist is the importance of insightful, insightful and innovative ways of thinking. You'll be competing against a lot of very, very clever people, and there's inevitably therefore a premium for establishing a competitive edge. The best example of innovative research I ever saw was that conducted by a colleague of mine when I worked at SG Warburg. David Mars, whom I'd recently recruited from the European Commission to cover the major continental European economies, decided after the Berlin Wall came down in 1989 and German unification was on the cards, to take his family on a three-week-long camper van trip to East Germany. While there, he checked out the state of the East German infrastructure. I don't quite know what his family thought of this. He never told me, but mm. he spent a lot of time checking out the state of the German infrastructure. Mm. He decided that it would cost an absolute arm and a leg to upgrade it. And he came back to London and wrote a report to that effect. Such a conclusion went down very badly indeed with the West German political and financial establishment, who were arguing at the time that German unification would cost very little indeed. But David proved absolutely right. And German taxpayers over 30 years after unification are still paying a unity surcharge. The sixth and final point I just like to make about being an economist generally, actually, not just working in the city, is the critical importance of keeping up. And we deal with that, as Andy highlighted earlier, in chapter 10, which is how to stay a successful economist. You do have to keep up with the latest developments in economic thinking, whether emanating from universities or from research institutes. When I first started out in the late 70s, it wasn't easy. I subscribed to the Economic Journal and then to the American Economic Review because I wanted to go international and see what was happening elsewhere. And of course, American economists were writing a lot of interesting stuff at the time. And I also searched out special papers. And I do remember that the LSE Bookshop, which is now Waterstones in Clare Market, just around the corner, was, was a, a, an abundant source of um, um, uh, supply in that regard. But now, of course, with the internet, there's an absolute profusion of research available, and the challenge is what to choose to read. You're absolutely spoilt for choice. In our book, we do provide some specific suggestions in this regard. Obviously, they're the economic, academic journals, which have actually multiplied over the years and were, were worth reading. They're multiple blogs. I mean, you have to be very selective about what you want to read, but there's some very, very good thinking out there. And of course, there's also the Vox EU website, which has been going now for over 10 years, actually over 15 years. And it's an absolute treasure trove of contemporary economic research, where researchers basically distill and summarize their conclusions in a very accessible and readable form. And I would just conclude that yet another is the continuing professional development program provided by the Society of Professional Economists, which we've all been involved over the years, and which was launched by Andy Ross a few years ago and is proving highly successful. Well, thank you very much for your attention. Those are the six points. I hope they're useful. And um, yes. I'll sit down and answer questions together with the rest of us. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you all very much, and actually also for keeping so elegantly to time. But before I open that, I want to ask one or two questions, challenging questions, because this is an attempt. Yes, your point of is trying to ensure people think 
in your terms that professionally economics profession is a good thing. Let me let me argue the contrary, but let me make a point. I'm looking up some evidence here. This is partly because of Brexit, the very thinking about the debate around Brexit before the referendum. This is an opinion poll, probably not an opinion poll. Which of the following do you think economists base their comments on? This is about Brexit. 21%. Mainly verifiable data and analysis. That means the other 79% think it's something else. Mainly personal opinions, 15%. Mainly political opinions or affiliations, 20%. All of the above, which includes the bank two, uh, 14, and then 30% don't know. Now, the point I'm making here is that economics, as you presented it, is a rational, enlightenment. Activity. It's a profession that's grown out of rational thought. But emotions taking far more bandwidth out of politics and economics these days. So the, the referendum was fought, certainly by the Remain side, on the subject of this is what will happen economically. It'll all go to the dogs. And that side lost. So do you think that economics as a whole is now threatened by a shift in public opinion? which not only in the matter of Brexit, but a whole range of single issues, people will not believe economists in the way they once did, once did, and that instead will want to believe what they feel. Is this damaging to economics? Um, well, it's, it's a very interesting question, but of course, if you look at, at what the opinion polls tell you now, um, uh, the latest one, which was um, March the 10th, just, just a few days ago, uh, said that it would be if we were voting today, there would be a clear majority to stay. Uh, and the main reason for that is because people have seen the impact on the economy. So they haven't seen any economic benefits, they've seen lots of disbenefits. So in many ways, whether economists used used emotion in their in their calculations or anything else, um, they seem to have got it right. Um, and but what uh, what I think is is also important to to know is that there are times, and I'm sure Andy will talk about that, when looking at historical evidence uh, makes it difficult to come to any serious conclusion because you haven't seen this sort of thing happen before. So we were basically working on what happens if you move in reverse from all the benefits you were getting when you were in there, um, and it was a lot of uncertainty as to exactly what type of of agreement there was going to be at the end of the day. You know how harsh you, you know how whether it would be a real sort of hard Brexit, not a hard Brexit, single market, not one. What, and so, but in terms of the general terms, even the twenty one percent, whatever it is, uh, they're obviously putting barriers on uh, trade with the main country, with, uh, the main region with which you trade, making it more expensive to do so. It has to have negative impacts. I mean, that goes without saying. But, but I'm not arguing that the economists. Let's assume the economists got it 100 percent right. But I'm, I'm arguing that the rationality of the point, possibly the accuracy of the rationality of the point, now arguably matters rather less than other things that help make decisions. That's the cost-benefit analysis mentioned in the book. Um, if you look at levelling up policy, it's not based on Green Book at all. It's based on a sense of whether social value can come out. And he did make the point that it's not just cost-benefit analysis. Get that. But all I'm going to get into the discussion is that there's more, that's a challenge that the economics profession as politics as itself and the way we all think is influenced by new factors more than before. Before I becomes the way that the Green Book and others have been changed, including on on uh, on um, uh, climate change, is that you you make you you change the way in which you calculate any additional spending that is done in terms of the cost benefit by assuming a certain thing is 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 what you want to achieve. So if you made the policy decision, which is a policy decision, it's not necessarily an economic decision, that that leveling up is what you're aiming for, then obviously the way you can calculate the cost benefits is already taking into account the fact that you're looking for more level, you know, you're looking to have various benefits, but you probably would not want to even contemplate before when obviously the greatest, uh, the greatest buck for your money, if you like, is to put a lot of money into the Southeast, because that's where there's more productivity, there's more ability to multiply that into something which can then be distributed to the rest of the, of the economy. So if you were just doing it that way, then it's pure economics. If you 
uh, put anything else in. It's not the economists who are putting the in general uh, this this uh, bar, if you like, from which you start. Uh, it's more politics, and maybe it's maybe it's emotion of the population as a whole. That's politics. Anyway, yeah. Anne, sorry, I don't know. Well, of course, the economy should rule the world. That's quite right. Um, but um, yeah, you don't necessarily need to look at what you call very hard, very hard data. I mean, you've got a long um, heritage of things we know are, are pretty sensible from economics over a long period. Uh, so Brexit, we have the gravity model, which is one of the most empirically um, verified things. You don't actually go out and look at the data. We know that's important. We know that if you hit the economy with a, a large decrease in aggregate demand on the cusp of a recession, that isn't a good thing to do. You know, that's, you, you know these things. You learn. Although you, you're right, because Dame uh, Kate Barker in her interview says that she, she criticises the way economists put it. Uh, across, perhaps, and you know, I wish economists had more say. I mean, I wish we had as much influence as some books suggest we have. Um, but, but there we go. Um, but she said, you know, it should have been a personal thing. The GDP is very abstract, and that's very important if it decreases. But it's things like you, know, you, you won't be able to send your pets on holiday so easy, or something. Or you won't be able to retire in Spain uh, so easily. She she thought that message wasn't put uh, across as well. Um, so yes. Um, it's it's uh, we, we still need more economists, I'm afraid. But I come back to it, uh, and the more economists, and you meet more economists and talk to them as human beings rather than this abstract uh, species. Uh, I mean, economists get simultaneously criticised. I don't understand it. Uh, economists. Um, they're all the same. They all believe this. And economists, well, they never agree. They, they, they can never agree on anything. Simultaneously, we get these uh, you know, contradictory criticisms. So when the Queen, in this yeah. in, in one of our earlier new buildings, um, challenged the economist's profession pretty directly about why nobody had seen the trade crunch coming, coming, there was then an inquiry which said there was groupthink amongst economists, as I remember it. Um, yeah. I um well, I'd be controversial. I, I I think actually a lot of economists did see it coming, and some of the people should have seen it coming didn't. But also some economists were in positions where it would be very difficult for them to call it out. And the central bank shouldn't be saying, Oh, we're on the cusp of an awful, terrible recession. That isn't going to help it. Uh John Llewellyn, uh, who is a chief economist of Lehman Brothers, uh, who came to SP um continuous professional development program, very good. And he was saying, actually, he said, yeah, you can't predict when, uh, but you can predict what would happen if you called out, you know, Lehman's is about to go bust. I'm really worried about its capital structure uh, and macro prudence. It's also something he could have called out, but he said privately, lots of people didn't know. And there are, I mean, Anne Petter thought, I think she has a very strong claim. Uh, she, she did see it coming and she called it out. I know people called it out in circumstances that I won't relate to, uh, to um, but uh, yes. In some areas, there was group things. The other thing is, of course, not all economists are in forecasting. It's only actually a minority who actually do it. Okay, one final question for me, and then I'm going to have another challenge, which is this. So, did you want to say you did want to? Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, sorry. sorry. I, I thought you meant on the global financial right. crisis. I mean, um, you're, you're right. I mean, there, there was an element of the group thing, but also there were lots of economists in investment banks, of which I was one, that were very aware that massive imbalances were building up. But as Andy says, and as John Llewellyn said, the question was the timing when the things going to break loose. And that's essentially a humble basketball. But the good news, I think, was that policymakers knew their onions as far as economic yeah. and It wasn't just Ben in the States, also elsewhere. And what threatened to be a repeat of the Great Depression and global industrial production and trade were collapsing at a rate analogous to that of the early 30s in the winter of 2008, 2009. The steps were taken to actually arrest that and um, everything um, gradually improved. And we had a very long expansion after that, of course. But just on economists in general, I'm going to slightly take a slightly different tenor because I, I think economists can do better. And I think economists must do better for their credibility. I think what they have to do is firstly explain themselves very clearly. Here we come to the issue of complexity, like back to first principles, explain it in not in words of one syllable, but, but explain it without reference to economic jargon. Secondly, I think they have to cite evidence more often. All too often you see old beds in newspapers where there's no reference to evidence whatsoever. I think they really ought to cite the evidence. And finally, I think they ought to admit their mistakes and try to learn from them. And I mean, it, 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 everybody makes mistakes, as I think Andy said, 
Um, I've made lots of mistakes, but hopefully I've tried to learn from them. And um, that's the way forward, of course. So uh, I think economists have to be humble. If we haven't got the public recognition we'd like, particularly from the politicians, we ought to work a little bit harder at getting it. On that second point, at that point you made one other point that I'd like us to challenge you on, which is that economics is full of really interesting concepts and ideas, which I've learned a huge amount from. Mm -hmm. But they are, and I know all professions are guilty of this to some degree, but they are put across in such terms of art that it's very hard to take moral hazard, which I was about to mention. Oh, moral hazard, really useful concept. No, 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 not useful at all. Sorry. <laughs> It did us such harm during the financial crisis. Moral hazard is, a, is then not useful, but I'm just taking the word itself, the words themselves, or supply side. Okay? <laughs> or I wrote a list for myself autarky, arbitrage, the Laffer curve. These are all terms that are regularly used by economists in the media, often city economists, sometimes academic ones, which, you know, we can all go and look them up. But I'm just saying that I, I would mean, argue that lawyers, dare I say it, often use terms that are a little bit easier for the public to understand in public discourse. Reasonableness, for example, precedent, guilty, you know, judgment, failure in law. So I don't want to have a go because it's stopped having a go in the moment. But do you think the economists are slightly, you know, sort of embraced jargon in public more than they should? Yes. Well, I, I would agree with that. Yes, yeah. it's just a cruel pan. You yeah. assume that people know what they're talking about when they don't, which is a symptom of not actually thinking about your audience properly. Okay. So I agree with that. So there is a problem. As you know, there's been this review, there one mentioned the BBC again, um, of, uh, of whether they are um, capable of, of, of encouraging the sort of economic discussion, understanding what what. Uh, what economics is all about, because there was a review of impartiality of the BBC, as you know, Andrew Dillnot uh, and, 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 and somebody else. Um, I, I was one of the people interviewed, so there were a hundred names afterwards that they, they had published, but they didn't, uh, they didn't um, say what each person said, but there was no doubt that we all thought that there is a lack of understanding, and one of the reasons why perhaps there's sometimes there is this belief that, you know, we're all talking, uh, you know, it's cross purposes as economists is because the the various presenters, if you like, or anyone who asks a question, doesn't really know how to follow up and and check the validity of various things, and and uh, and it does. It's very difficult for an economist then to, to react to that. I I do remember, you know, there's this one morning when I was driving the kids to school, and and Radio Four had had uh, a thing about obesity, which of course is all over, you know, the newspapers again. Uh, and it and it started by saying this researcher, economic researcher, in Lapura somewhere, um, had done this uh, this study which showed, would you believe this, that the children of mothers who work tend to be more obese than uh, fatter than those who don't work. So you can imagine there was this, you know anyone who was driving the kids to school at that time would have been feeling guilty, thinking, oh my gosh, should I give up my job? What am I going to do with my kids? All sorts of things. And then policy was being debated in the program. You know, well, in that case, you know, what we need to do is, is make sure that the kids after school are not allowed to do whatever it is and someone comes and looks at the bar. And I was screaming at the radio saying, what about causality? What about causality? And after about 10 minutes of this, the researcher said, oh, we haven't proven causality. What, what was the point of this? So, so I think you're right. And economists can get it wrong. But also, um, the person who was asking the question should really have got that question out a lot earlier, so we would not have been committing suicide while we were driving. <laughs> and in fact, and you mentioned this earlier in the book, you do deconstruct in reference to the Daryl Huff book, I remember from Thousand <laughs> How to Draw Charts, it's not a bad place. Anyway, enough from me. Uh, who would like to? I'm sure I hope I haven't put anybody off, by the way. The person's are becoming a successful economist, you haven't already. Anybody like to ask a question or make a comment? Okay, uh, take those two hands there together, take two at a time. If you're online and would like to ask something, feel free to add it in the um, chat function. Isn't one of the uh, best? Who you are, and we don't have to, but you <coughs> Certainly, well, my name's Ian Oakley and I'm a citizen of the world. Um, isn't one of the best things about being an economist is the, the chance to be a central banker? Because as a central banker, you've got immense power little scrutiny uh, you've got great job prospects afterwards if you fancy running italy 
as prime minister, you don't have to get elected. And the best one for me, or the slightly weird here, is how uh, at Nuremberg, the Reichs uh, Bank chief got off, mainly because of the intervention of the Bank of England and the Federal Reserve. So even then, the, the central bankers stuck together. So isn't that one of the best opportunities of being an economist is to become a central banker? Okay, I'm sure our panel will have something to say on that. And um, was another question from behind. Oh, just behind. Thank you, Nick Hadjanikos. If you applied the presentation and everything in the book directly to the news of the day, citing today's acquisition of the UK arm of SVB Bank, is this just an issue for small, possibly narrow banks with limited investment spreads? maybe with risk committees made up of rather amateurish fintech founders, or to be concise and to the point, is Robert Peston grabbing his coat? Those two questions. Uh, being a central banker, well, um, I wouldn't envy being a central banker at the moment, frankly. I mean, on the years of zero interest rates and quantitative easing, which effectively could be seen as the easy way out, um, you know, because it went on for a very long time, they've now actually got to extricate themselves for that, and it's not going to be easy. We saw what the Fed tried to do 2016, 2017, 2018, then backed off. We can see what's happening now with this bank failure in the States, which is certainly due to the fallout of the bond markets over the last year. So, so it's not an easy job at all, because you have to balance inflation, which of course is has been unleashed, with employment and, of course, financial stability. So I, I think it's a pretty challenging job at the moment. Um, on the question of the bank failure, um, I'm going to sound awfully consensual here, but I do think it will prove to be something which has been headed off. I mean, clearly, the large banks in the States are heavily supervised. They do look to be in good shape. It's the smaller banks, the more regional banks, which are a threat. But it does look as if the Federal Reserve and indeed the British government have stepped in very quickly to try and nip any contagion in the bud. Now, I hope I won't turn out to have to eat those words subsequently, but you know, I think, again, they have learned the lessons of history. Um, although, of course, you know, there, 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 there is a problem that might be more out there. Um, the key question, of course, is how the Federal Reserve and other central banks respond to this. Do they actually hold off from getting inflation under control? A fear of precipitating another accident, so to speak, or do they go ahead? And I think that's the key question we'll all be debating over the next few months. Thank you. Um, uh, well, I probably left it a bit late because we paid off the central bank, and uh, I was never in that league anyway. Uh, I'm only doing a new job. Um, I notice I have a very, very trying to have more credibility and uh, transparency now. Uh, I can't really, I'll leave that completely in uh, people who have more chance of that. Uh, the crisis, or, or just to add, I think they've been working tremendously hard, and it was fantastic to be at the Treasury, frightening in the, cri the great financial crisis. But I went into the civil service when I was about 48 years old from academia, and I was very suspicious, you know what I'd say. But I came out uh, hugely uh, admiring many aspects of it and just how hard working. The civil service well and the, the knowledge there. So I, I, again, I, I have nothing but praise for the civil service, and I know they've been working very hard in the last uh, week or so. Um, I mean, it's interesting what you said about the, the, the Bank of England or being a central banker. Of course, they are they are now quite important uh, since the bank got its independence here. Of course, it's become more important. But I would suggest that uh, it's actually it's the Treasury where most of the power is in a particular country. It's the finance ministry. Uh, so we must, uh, of course, they are uh, links despite the independence, um, but, but really policy is determined mainly in terms of the economy by, by uh, the finance ministry in, in place. Now, be, being in the, the Bank of England, of course, would be brilliant. I, I mean, uh, it's being in the MPC for whatever it was, 30 years before they had to increase, it wasn't 30 years they had to increase interest rates. Fantastic job, meeting every month and doing nothing. Um, so I'm being paid for it. It's a little bit like an extension of the furlough scheme. So we had the furlough scheme going on for, for decades. So, so this was brilliant. Uh, but obviously the job is very important. It's become more complicated uh, because of everything that's happening. Plus, of course, that the Bank of England has taken on a lot more uh, duties again, which it had given away to, or at least had been given away when it became independent. Um, so you have to watch the financial stability issues, not just interest rates, of course. There's a lot more. But uh, you saw the interview, those who arrived early, with Andy Haldane, who was the chief economist of the Bank of England. We asked him that question. I asked him. I was doing that interview. Um, and I said, oh, Andy, you know, you've been in the Bank of England all your life. So he started telling me 
big what you said, fantastic job, da 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 da. And then he resigned a week later. <laughs> so so maybe maybe we had an influence on that. I don't know. We thought about it. Different it's a good flex, <laughs> but then it's just one little thing. The only problem that I have with economists in the, the second um, banks is that there is now an element of group thing. Everyone was thinking was thinking we should raise interest rates because uh, you know we need to deal with inflation, mainly because they were attacked for letting inflation supposedly you know go up as it did, whereas I don't think it had very much to do with them at all. Uh, and I think what they had done until then was pretty sensible, and now we are in this position we're in. So what's happened with this bank is really because uh, long-term uh, bond yields have gone up, uh, mortgage uh, bonds have gone up as well, which is really what that particular bank uh, was investing in. Um, and when they tried to sell them because their prices, the, the actual uh, bond prices had come down so significantly, they were basically insolvent um, when others tried to take the money out. I mean, the tech sector itself is a pretty uh, dangerous one. Many of the companies that, that had money with them were not making any profits. They needed to use some of the cash, tried to make the cash out. They needed to balance their books. They tried to sell the bonds. So it is a serious issue that we have gone into the direction of this type of policy, which has raised uh, bond yields, coming down a little bit recently, uh, which could have very significant repercussions for anyone who holds those bonds. So it could indeed spread to other banks. And, and at least what has happened now is calmed the markets up to a point. But, uh, and also what we might see, this is an interesting thing. We all thought the next, uh, we all thought, uh, I'm thinking, yeah. uh, the, the markets thought that the next move of the, of the Federal Reserve is going to be possibly 25 or 50 basis points. We couldn't quite decide it was 25 first. Then uh, Powell sounded pretty pretty hawkish, so they thought 50. Today's expectation was zero, that interest rates were not going to go up at all because of what's happened. I'll say, well, I'm sort of mildly preparing since now. I looked at the online, at the Silicon Valley Bank's um, state of the market report for the first half of 2023, which I'm sure will be a collector's item from here on. Anyway, um, I'm going to yeah. here. Mr. Corbyn and I once heard a, a, an economist passionately uh, protest and said 95% of economists don't believe in herding. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually scary. Then we have from an online question here from E. Stanley, uh, which is with reference to Vicky Price's point that better measurement of unproductive activities is unproductive in inverted commas, I'm not It's activity that is essential. How much is the unpaid work of home carers, the self of disabled and elderly worth about five to six million people. There's a view that they say the tax burden at the cost of the entire NHS. And a good example of how a piece of analysis can throw a light on what would otherwise be an invisible issue that economists can contribute to, right? Well, economists and statisticians, if I may say so, the, the ONS has been doing very good work on this and has measured this sort of unproductive, uh, if you want to call it that, we only call it that. It is in inverted commas. Yeah. Yes, yes. And, and in my side, it was in inverted commas. So, so, he, he's, so Evelyn Stanley uh, really uh, you know, looked at the slide properly. Well, it shows that it was shown well and clearly on, on their screens, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, so, so they are calculating and estimating what, uh, what, what this, this unmeasured, um, work that people do, which is unproductive mainly because it doesn't have a, a, a price attached to it. Because, so for example, if if I have a, a, a nanny looking after my kids, I pay her, then she's part of the economy and it counts as GDP. If I do it, it doesn't. So, so, uh, so if you calculate what what the uh, impact would be, I think the estimate is at least a billion, sorry, a trillion. Uh, of all the work that isn't that, and we and, and that includes, of course, things like all the time you spend doing charity charity work, which is usually unpaid, um, uh, or you know, if you're driving your kids to to school, that is considered so I think, uh, whatever was years ago, um, that is considered to be unproductive as well, even though you actually didn't use public transport. If you were using public transport and paying for it, it would have been considered as you know so. So it's very tricky, but uh, the ONS has done very good work on this. They have just updated it, uh, and, and that is all available on the website. Household accounts. I think household accounts. I was struck by this, but I saw that if you actually, the typical woman, if you estimate the market value of the work she actually does, um, it would be a huge amount, about £120,000 or something a year. 
Uh, so if we did cry at sitting, there'd be a lot of shocked husbands mm -hmm. that find they can't afford their wives. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it just shows the scale of how it is. But yes, it's an enormous amount of unmeasured. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, what we should all do, of course, is do each other's housework yeah. and then just swap the money backwards and forwards and then GDP would soar. I mean, it wouldn't change. Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Heath explained invisibly good, invisibly complicated work or something. Is that anyway? No, okay. All right, let's take some more questions. Yes, right. One, two, and then three. So one, two, and then three. Where was it? It's Katie is faster. Um, I was very interested in your talk, Vicky. Um, partially because I have a teenage daughter who is very interested in economics. And I, I just looked up on my phone, which is a bit naughty. 70% um, of A-level students studying <coughs> economics are boys. And of the 30% who do study, the girls that do study, only 16% of them go on to study economics at university. And I, and I appreciate the fact that you're highlighting this, as indeed did the previous question um, that was just asked about unpaid labor, which is predominantly women's work. But it strikes me that since your book is entitled How to be a Successful Economist, uh, you know, it should be How to be a Successful Male Economist. Like you've missed a word out of your title. And, I, you know, I, I think I'm going to challenge the four of you with the greatest of respect to the four of you that if you really want to have a successful economist, you've got to stop filtering out the girls. And you guys got to get into the high schools and make sure girls are studying economics. That's 50% of the population. I think he's the right person to answer that. She's written yeah. about this before, so we'll come back to that further along now. Uh, Dominic, yeah. uh, can you just wait for the microphone? Sorry. Sorry. I'm a journalist, and I've never had any pretensions to be an unsuccessful economist, let alone a successful one. But can I just ask Vicky Price, after years of struggle, I finally thought that I more or less half understood what moral hazard was. And so can you explain why it's a completely useless concept? <laughs> Thank you. And then on the front row, on the front row, yes, on the right-hand side in front of you. No, no. Sorry. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, hi, Mugishora. Um, uh, so focusing on how economists within the private sector and public sector operate, uh, what lessons do you think could be learned from each other? Right. Mm -hmm. I have indeed. And I come back to I've, I've worked totally in the private sector and primarily on the so-called sell side too, which means you have to push your ideas to people and it's a very competitive environment. Um, what lessons can you learn? Well, I, I think the main lesson, um, maybe I'm repeating myself ad nauseam, is communication. You really do have to explain things simply, not because you're dealing with stupid people, but because you're dealing with very busy people who don't have much time and have access to lots of other people if you're not up to scratch. So um, you really have to come up with clear ideas and hopefully very inventive ideas. I mean, I cited that example of innovative research because I think it was absolutely mind-blowing at the time that my colleague actually had this idea of going off on a camper van holiday. But, um, but basically, um, it, that's what you have to do. And um, I mean, I cannot speak about what public sector economists can learn from private sector economists because I just don't know how public sector economists operate. So I'll have to dodge this one, I'm afraid. It's couple of women talk about that. Communication key, I think, and coming up with new ideas and fresh ways to look at things absolutely essential. My God, I imagine that's also true in the private sector, in the public sector. But I want to come back to the just okay, the, but um, and you just do the public private one, public private one. Okay. Okay. But on the gender one, I just want to say, I'm not making to say, but yeah, yes, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's uh, uh, terrible. I mean, it's uh, it goes between about a third and a quarter of UK um undergraduates. Um, uh, 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 women and uh, you know, it's always well, struck me in the GS, um, you know, two thirds of the GS of male and three quarters of government social researchers were, were female, um, not on an individual basis. But um, I thought, why was that? Well, what is that economics putting off? And when we look in the book, other countries, it isn't the same, it's different, there's much better gender balance in other countries. Also, if you look at practitioner outfits, IFS, NISA, etc., they're better than academia. Which is surprising because that uh, teaching, should, you know, is, is dominated by women. Um, well, not dominated. I mean, statistically, the primary school teachers are women, the heads of often men. Um, but uh, why sh why should that be? 
And uh, I do think that if you, you know, if you want to have the bad um, visual optic, it's too much, it, it, it's men, sorry, so these men look like me in Tony uh, making a lot of money. Um, and that's a sort of public image. And discovery economics, which I can recommend, very you know, discovery economics, uh, the SP sponsored the Royal Economic Society and the Government Economic Society. Uh, and they're trying to change that because economics is about, you know, lots and lots of things in uh, real life and uh, things that affect us all. Uh, so I agree, and we should do something about it. And of course, as men do dominate economics, the yeah. evidence should be on men to do something about it. Um, but just so we are, of course, going into schools, and you know, a number of us have been doing it uh, for, for years, trying to encourage some uh, women to take up economics or explaining what 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 economics are about, or looking at specific subjects and and getting them enthused that way. And a lot more needs to be done. But there are some some things. There. The, the, the first thing is that uh, because of our uh, our city, the, the prominence of the city, the prominence of the financial sector in the UK. Uh, the view is of, of any modest economics that that's really what you end up doing, working working in the financial sector. And that puts quite a lot of women off, probably. Um, what has happened more recently, of course, is that, you know, uh, and Gus knows that very well, is that the whole sort of behavior economics, uh, which has developed and where one works very closely with the, psych with the psychologists and also, of course, with, with the other disciplines that exist in social sciences. Uh, is, is particularly important for encouraging more people to come forward. But we have a problem in this country, which is that um, the loads of, of the independent sector all do um, economics, as, uh, as far as I know, you see, and A levels. Uh, what you find that half of the comprehensives do not do A level economics. So loads of people lose out. Uh, I mean, of course, boys lose out as well, but maybe they can get it later. But for the women, it, it may have been lost forever. And I think that that is a problem and we need to address it. Now, moral hazard, uh, if I could talk about that. Um, I mean, basically what, what it means is that it's, you know, it, it, it should be, you should be discouraged uh, from helping one, uh, one individual or one entity that is in trouble because then all the others will think they can behave badly and, uh, and then we'll have them all be in trouble. Uh, this is, of course, the sort of mistake that was um, that was done with the, the eurozone crisis, where um, let's not save Greece because you know then we will encourage everybody else to be to be. That was the bit for a while, uh, and then you realise, and this is what happened with Greece: it lost twenty seven percent of its GDP, yeah. absolutely terrible. But then they realised they couldn't not save the rest, which is exactly what happened with the financial crisis as well. Uh, where you know Mervyn King was then the head of the Bank of England, the governor of the Bank of England, was going around saying, no, we, we mustn't support, you know, help the one bank that's in difficulty, uh, because uh, then all the others would think we're going to step in and do something. So we let them, you know, we let them default. But in the end, we hardly let anyone default because the the, the impact for financial stability would have been terrible. So so that's why moral hazard as a concept. Sounds all right, but to put it into practice is the worst mistake you can possibly make. And going around saying moral hazard, moral hazard, we're not going to help you, then makes the crisis worse. And then you have to spend an awful lot more saving the situation. So that's basically why I am uh, worried about, about the term being used. So I don't know whether I've forgotten something else. No, that's it. Okay, think we're right. Uh, right, I'd like to take one more uh, a couple more questions from you, Bruno. Well, okay, three, one, I think cannot be quick because I've got a very mischievous question. But uh, first, I'll introduce myself. My name is Crosby Pumberry, and I'm an investment broker and a former student of uh, Andy Ross. Um, my question is that um, as the economies change in terms of um, ranking the United States falling behind China. The evidence over the past 500 years is that uh, whenever there is that change of, if you can call it a world order essentially, that tends to be followed by war first as the new um, leader gets established. I would like to hear your comments um, as economists on that, please. Thank you. 
uh, sort of economics and international relations degree idea there. Mm -hmm. So two, I'll take all five. So two questions here and then two back here and then answer as many as you wish, but not all. Yeah. Um, further to one of the previous questions, as two girls currently studying economics in year 12, um, what steps can be made both by educational institutes, the government and us individuals to close the gap between genders when studying economics at school? And what do you think are the fundamental reasons girls are less likely to study economics? Very good. Do you want to be a politician? Is that yes, your it's a joint question. Joint, but it's very good. That's very interesting indeed. That's very interesting if ever I've seen it. Look back over here. I think it's okay. two people. I'm going to allow two people from back here. We've just seen that uh, rate the the traditional kind of tool for economists with interest rates and delta of interest rates is not going to work. The uh, bank's tier capital ratio has been wiped out, and reality is there is no way we can keep rates, uh, keep raising rates in this in this situation. So what next? Okay. I think you did mention it, it's a good point. And then one other, yep. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, my name is uh, Samin Farouk within the uh, ONS. Uh, I'm just about to take part in um, uh, helping to recruit apprentice uh, for GES, for economics apprenticeships. Within the book, what are the barriers that you've identified uh, for uh, people to be able to study economics that we uh, we should be mindful of. Um, can I just take a moment just to answer one question from Tony about the issue about belief and uh, why people didn't really believe economists? I tend to find during my career that economists were rarely listened to by people who whose own money was, wasn't out to take the decisions that they had to take. Okay, fair enough. Good to... Answer my question. Thank you for that. Right. Um, then, Jill, really you've got to answer them all. Answer any of those excellent questions you would like. <laughs> oh, um, about war? No, I, I, I mean, uh, we are in a war situation right now, of course. Um, and uh, and we all know the worries that everyone everyone has about China and what they might do next. And of course, we already have you know, trade wars which have intensified. We now have, you know, even Richard Sunak not quite deciding whether to say that China is a is is, is a country to 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 watch or you know one that um, whatever the expression was he, he managed to steer it uh, in the middle course. So so yes, I think I think we we need to be prepared for for everything. The only question is how. Um, and and I do remember I've been thinking about about the. Uh, working in the private sector because I worked for quite some time in the private sector, yeah. building on companies and doing consulting. And when I was working in oil company, we were doing scenario planning. And 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 of course, you, you look at everything, including you know instability in the future and all that sort of stuff. So you had you do the best case scenario. You had a really good no, you had a, a, a the one you really believe would happen, which is a middle one, a really best case scenario. And then you had a catastrophe scenario. Uh, you always said that as a scenario. I had to go and learn about scenario planning in some place in Switzerland when I was um, hired to work there. Apparently, that's how you do it. Maybe things have improved since. But anyway, um, the interesting thing is that you could do nothing about the catastrophe scenario. We just parked it. Um, and then, of course, it happened. And for them, the catastrophe scenario was having oil prices at, my, at less than 10 dollars a barrel. And then just closed everything. No investment. Now, imagine doing that scenario at the time when um, during COVID we had oil prices at minus $37 a barrel. Well, I mean, would you ever have planned for this? No. no. So, so that's the difference. Really. On the link between wars and economics, I recommend Martin Wolf for the origins of the Second World War. And it's clearly linked, and you have to be uh, aware of that from history. And, you know, I would. Um, you know, you, you've got to be careful when you appease and when you don't. But, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's very serious stuff and uh, the world order will be changing. We mentioned that in the book. That's one of the things that uh, will change what the economists have to look at. I mean, I think it's outside economics. I, I just perhaps caution that, you know, it is sometimes that people aren't necessarily evil, but they, I mean, often, sometimes they are, but sometimes they generally see things in a different way. Uh, and so you need to think about um, the primacy and whatever, because that's the reality of it. 
Uh, on education and, and gender, yes, very much so. Good, good, carry on. That's good, you're quite right. I, I do recommend the website, uh, say, dis Discover Economics, if you haven't come across that. It's very, very good. Lots of interviews and things. And try and dispel this image of economics about, you know, it's pale male and stale men like me uh, earning uh, lots of money. We have to change that. Um, John Kay has an interesting thing, a speculative one, and he, he points out how males very much like computer games uh, more than um, uh, women and, and females. And he, he, he speculates something like men who like a sort of private, nerdy stuff or something. It's this hugely stereotype that, of course, we talk about averages. Uh, but so, whereas males might like to differentiate differentiate the polynomials in private. Um, women are more likely to uh, look out and actually say, what does this matter? What's the, what's the import of the federal world? And if you do actually look at academia, as I say, in universities, it's, women are grossly underrepresented, uh, and it's a better gender balance in the practitioner one, uh, outfits that actually do go out and look at uh, real-world issues. Um, and so in the book also, though, we from the Behavioural Insights team, uh, which gives you some stuff, we go through long lists of the sort of things that can help uh, increase diversity, including gender diversity, in organisations. And I can recommend uh, that to you as well. Just to further where you, where you need to start, I think more women go to university than men these days, by, by some margin, so it's clearly an economics issue. <laughs> yes, because I mean, some foolish people say it's about maths, but that's that's complete yeah, nonsense. That's yeah. completely nonsense. The women are just as good as STEM subjects. Uh, if I could just make three observations to a number of the questions. First, on the question of geopolitical conflict, I guess the uh, paradigm that we all look back to is the outbreak of the First World War. And I think the lesson there is that nobody thought it was going to happen. Nobody yes. thought it was going to be that stupid, and yet it did. And of course, you know, that led to the Second World War or appeasement before the Second World War. And then you had another disaster. But uh, I think the key thing is to be very wary because, you know, nasty things can happen very easily. And that's the lesson of 1914. Um, on the question of interest rates, again, and the fact that people aren't expecting a Fed rate hike now at all, or at least the markets aren't, um, I think central bankers, it goes back to what I said earlier about it being a very difficult job at the moment. They've got to choose between risking inflation staying high or preserving financial stability, because if interest rates go higher, there may well be more financial accidents as equity and bond markets sell further. And central bankers don't know that, but they may be coming. Do they actually break more things unintentionally, or, or do they actually possibly sacrifice price stability? I mean, it may be that inflation just comes down, the miraculous disinflation that so many people have been hoping for until recently. Um, I'd be very surprised if that were to happen. So I think there's a massive dilemma there with financial stability. And it's finally on the, the point about female participation, if you like, in economics. I'm genuinely puzzled by this. I really don't know why more women don't study economics and take up jobs as economists. The last recruitment I made 10 years ago was in fact for female, but then that was a very impressive individual. But I, I just make a reference back to what I did um, over 20 years ago. I have two daughters, and my daughters have always been told they couldn't play football when they were young. And I, like many other fathers at the time, I think, got involved in grassroots football, developed female football teams, set them up from scratch, developed them, coached them. And look what's happened. Female football is now very popular. And you all know what happened so last that's summer. You. No, that's no, not good. at all. It's it's very good. But thousands of people like me around the country, I think, put time and effort into encouraging that. And, um, you know, what Vicky and Andy have said about Discover Economics, I think, is truly inspiring in that regard. But obviously more needs to be done. Yeah. Me, me commentary on it again next um, weekend. I just, uh, I just add that uh, female economists, they make great bosses. One of those um, ideal questions that comes in at the end of um, certain sort of radios and television programmes from many, it took a panel, if I pronounced that correctly, which is the panel is to refer to how the gift of what a gift economics is, how it teaches us to question and analyze. I would like to ask the authors if they have been any standout moments in their careers where they're training as economists, etc. So, standout moments in your career as an economist, one each. Sean Sharp, no, 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 no prior notice. So, what are some things in your career that you said, well, they're in the room to know to inspire them? To inspire them, well, I didn't really, but inspiring them better than yours. Well, I, I, I hadn't thought about that, but, uh, but what I can tell you is that um, obviously you like to be a role model, 
um, as an economist. Um, I mentioned that one of my daughters is here today. None of my five children decided to be an economist. So, <laughs> so I'm afraid I have failed completely in that respect. Although I have been a good boss for that's that's so I'm exactly the same boat. I've got three children and none decided to follow me to be an economist. Well, it's doctors, isn't it? Medical yeah. medics, it's very difficult. Sam Edmonds, Lee. Okay, well, I won't tell you the stand-up moment, uh, because I um, I was in Greece and decided to come and study in this country, and it was a time of the, of the colonels, and, and I needed to find an economist to teach me economics, because I really thought economics would be the thing. I was still 15 or whatever. Uh, and, uh, and my father found this professor who had been fired by the junta uh, to teach me. So... Um, uh, somebody recommended him. So I would go every week and, you know, ignored all my, you know, I was at the German school in, in Greece at the time, ignored anything that they were teaching me and would spend fantastic times understanding economics and, and really enjoyed it. Uh, and when I finished that year with him, we were just driving with my father when we were listening to the news through the radio. And it turned out, um, just in the news as we were listening, that this guy had just been arrested because... A bomb he was manufacturing had just blown up and blew his hand away, uh, and he was arrested. And this was the person who was teaching me economics. <laughs> so I had all my lessons. He was down in the basement, apparently, above the bomb factory. Uh, what, so which is quite extraordinary. And then, of course, they 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 uh, decided they uh, sentenced him to death. Um, but at the time, as um, you know, George Papandreou, the previous Prime Minister of Greece, is here, uh, remembers they didn't execute anybody. Um, and, and he came out and, and did very well. But apparently in his cell, uh, thinking about the central bankers, he taught economics to the chap next to him, who then became governor of the Bank of Greece. Now, how about that? <laughs> <laughs> my grandpa did to be in um, yeah. Greece's art collection. Very nice it was too, but that's another day. Um, We're close to time, obviously. Yeah, I'll be very There's been many, many stand-up moments. I think one of them was when an ex-Prime Minister of Greece came to listen to me talk. <laughs> um, definitely. Uh, all right. I, I, I used to love talking to Nick Sturm. Whenever I thought I was good at economics, I'd go in and half an hour later, I'd come out realising I, I didn't know nearly enough economics. Uh, but I once said to him foolishly when he was doing the Stern report on what was then called global warming, better to call it climate change. But I said to him jokingly, I'm going away next month. Could you just hop the place up a little bit? Go make sure I have good work. He said, uh, did, what did you have for breakfast? I said, what do you mean? He said, have you ever had boiled eggs? I said, yes. He said, what happens most of the time when you're boiling that pan? I said, nothing. He said, and as it gets close to the boiling, what happens? I go, well, it all starts to churn. But he goes, yeah, all hell is let loose. And he goes, that's a bit like climate change. A little bit changing change, which can make a difference. And then I wrote to the Guardian once and quoted him against the minister who said something really silly. And then this artist picked it up and did this wonderful painting of boiled eggs world eggs in the world and Nick Stern told phoned me up to say that I'd inspired an oil painting which, I, which is now hanging in the Grantham Institute. Yeah, that's <laughs> I, I think I mean people in my business in which I've got like 45 years like I said earlier I mean they 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 like to think in terms of sexual calls they made but I, I I'm very aware of what I said earlier because you actually learn from your mistakes or you should do. I do remember getting the so-called Lawson boom of the late 1980s very badly wrong indeed. I didn't realise it was going to implode as much as it did. And of course, we had a very, very nasty recession, which went on for ages in the early 90s as a consequence. But I did learn from that. I realised what I got wrong. In particular, I hadn't been looking for the flow of funds analysis. And I then applied that to the Japanese economy and got that absolutely right. Mm -hmm. uh, it didn't go down well in Tokyo, where, of course, they thought an economic growth was underway, and it did expose their feet to play. So you can learn through mistakes and um, pick yourself up, if you like, that's called being resilient, and then actually uh, apply it elsewhere. And the other thing I'd say, I, I think the highlight really is actually um, recruiting more economists to work together. I mean, I started out as one economist. 
There weren't that many economists in the late 1970s. And then, of course, the city grew in importance and people wanted to recruit more. And um, it was team building. It was recruiting good people and building them into a team where people work together, respect each other's opinions and work productively. Quite a challenge, very much like building a sports team, in fact. But, you know, it's coaching, really. And you do leave from the front. You have to leave from the front. Very good. Thank you, Brian. Now, um, Vicky tells me that uh, Mr. Papandre would like to say a word or two. No, just I'm... Uh, you sparked the story about economists. My father was an economist also, and um, during the junta, he was jailed. Uh, I'm the oldest in the family. My younger brother didn't really understand. Why is he in jail? Why is my, fa why is my father in jail? But he came up with an explanation. He said, you know, I think he's in there because he's in jail because he's He's teaching all, all the people that are in jail economy. <laughs> okay, now, sorry, I'll give everybody a round of applause in a minute. I just need to say this. First, I'd like to thank our three speakers, Vicky, Ian, Andrew, um, and Dee, for coming and giving us a certain show of economics and fun, which is a difficult question for people like me. Uh, now, there's an opportunity to buy the book, should you so desire. And what the way I'm going to be a drink outside, so it's a real sort of festival uh, this evening. So, I think the best way to do this is if you would like to buy it and have it signed, given there are so many authors and two or three of them are here, um, why not go and get one? And if you want to come and then you can chat to the authors as well, because only you might have the book to them, because you need to write for the book. All right. All right. The rest of us have a drink. Good idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, a round of applause for our.